scripture reading today, Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, first verses 1 through 6. When Jesus called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal, he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, not even an extra tunic. Whatever house you enter, stay there and leave from there. Wherever they do not welcome you as you are leaving that town, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They departed and went through the villages, bringing the good news and curing diseases everywhere. Heavenly Father, at this time we are asking you to pour your Holy Spirit upon us so we may understand your word and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And I'm going to tell you a story that a pastor who I know experienced at his church. So this is not my story, and so it's better. Pastor Rick, Pastor Rick had a chance to do a children's message one Sunday and he asked the kids, do you guys know who I am? Then they said, yeah, you are a pastor here. Then he asked them again, what does a pastor do at church? He was expecting to hear you know, preaching, teaching, or prayer, but some of the answers actually made him very embarrassed and think about his pastoral role at his church. One kid said, scratching people's head. <laughs> and I guess the kids saw pastor baptizing and sprinkling people's head. So he thought the pastor was scratching people's head. You know, another kid said, pastor parks at the best parking spot. <laughs> and another kid said, yeah, a pastor always eats first. <laughs> and Rick was feeling uneasy, uneasy with these uh, answers. And, you know, I think I should be uh, careful of what our kids think about what I say or what I do at this church. And the last one is, I think this is my favorite. And one kid said, the pastor takes all the offering. <laughs> I wish I could do that. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. Sorry, Trustee. <laughs> you know, believe it or not, some people, of course, non-believers, think that offering is to the pastor. Truly, they think that way. And they think that everything at church belongs to pastor. As you know, we had our website uh, name now, and each on the way, you're going to make my site. One of the uh, entries is jthebus.com. <laughs> and I'm sure this could be the funniest church website name in this country. <laughs> and pastors are the bus and take all the offerings. <laughs> and it doesn't sound right. It doesn't sound right. But back in the Old Testament, there are pastors called priests. They are actually the boss and take offerings. They represent God's authority, proclaiming God's word to the people and even to the king. So the nation actually belongs to the priest. Powerful, a very powerful position. So some people bring uh, so people bring offerings to them, and there are five major offerings. I'm not going to go detail. I'm going to just tell you what it is: burnt offering, grain offering, peace offering, sin and trespass offering. For each offering, people brought different animals or bread, and the priest offered it to God. Then they took the rest of the offerings for themselves. 
And the important thing is, every offering has one thing in common. The offerings are not just just the offering, but each one is a clear picture of God, a finger pointing to His presence and His power to protect the people. That's the purpose of the offering. People have to see God through what they give. And we can actually find this principle in the New Testament, Romans 11, chapter 36. Everything comes from God, everything exists by His power, and everything is intended for His glory. You know, this is the principle of ownership. We have to see that God owns it all and He loans some of to us. That's the purpose of giving offering and we have to see God. We give offering, but it's not just offering. We have to see behind. God is behind. But in the Old Testament, the purpose of offering doesn't go as it should. The priests are corrupt. They are corrupt. You know, I want you to know the priests are simply human beings like you and, you and me. They are not angels or any supernatural being. So instead of looking at God and worshiping Him, they, work, they begin to see their political power and authority and take advantage of it. I can simply say they are corrupt. You know, when leaders are corrupt, everything goes wrong. Everything could go wrong. And this basic principle can be applied to any place. Maybe your home, this church, this town, this nation. That's why we need to careful to vote on who's going to be the next, next leaders for this country. So Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 31, it says, The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule on their own authority. And my people love it. Do you hear that? My people love it. The leaders are corrupt and the people love it. In 1 Samuel 8, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel, uh, Israelite leaders, but his sons did not follow his way. They turned aside after this honest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. You know, Samuel was one of the greatest prophets in the scripture, and his sons were wicked. It means everyone, everyone, could be corrupted, no matter who you are. You know, there is a city scandal in 2010 in Southern California. It happened in the city of Bell. It is a small community and the population is mostly seniors who lived below the poverty. It's a very poor city. But the city officers, including the mayor, set their own salary, 10 times higher than the average salary. One city council member is half time, but his annual compensation was $900,000, 20 times more than the city council. Chief police officer makes $1.5 million per year. It was a big scandal at the time, and people got upset and angry. You know, they should be the most trusted working for people. Instead, they stole money from people. You know, this is exactly what happened in the Old Testament. The priests were corrupt. They stole money from, from God, actually. So in the New Testament, Jesus gave his disciples and his followers a different command. Take nothing. Take nothing for your journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Matthew chapter 10 says, no extra sandal. 
In order to preach the gospel at the time, those items are necessary. Without it, the missionary journey would be very, very difficult. It's like you go on a fishing, a fishing trip without a fishing pole. You harvest without a combined harvest machine. How could you do that without those machines? So back in those times, all those things, bag and bread, money, extra shirt and sandal are necessary. But Jesus said, no, 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 no. Don't take those things. Don't take any necessities. Then you will see God, who is the provider in his own way. This time God is going to provide you in his own way. Don't take anything from people. Top command. Top command. Very top command. You know, there are no high priests anymore in the New Testament. And there are a type of New Testament believers and those who follow Christ. So, 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen people and royal priest. So we are, we are priests now. We are God's priests. We are the followers of Christ. So God's principle is applied to us. Don't take any necessities. Don't take anything from people. You need to see God is beyond all the events. God is the ultimate provider. You have to see it. The offering you give to the church, offering you to the missionary, the money you spend for whatever, whatever, all those events, God is behind. You have to see that. All the events of, events of giving and receiving, God is the provider. I know you giving many things to this church or those who are in need. Your finance, advice, experiences, skill, and even your best cooking recipe. You know, I saw actually a cookbook met by our church, I don't know what is it called, and if you have a digital file, please let me have it. You know, that's a million dollar outreach tool. I can put it on website or newsletter later, then I believe many, many people are attracted to go on our website and read the book recipe. So if you have any digital file, please let me have it. That's a great book. So we are giving many things to the church. And that type of giving might be in vain though, unless you know who our ultimate provider is. James 1.4 So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Did you hear that? When your endurance is fully developed, you will need nothing. In verse 5, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and He will give it to you. But when you ask, be sure that your faith is in God alone. God alone. You giving, receiving. You're not the one who are giving and receiving. God is behind. God is behind. That's the principle. That's the biblical principle. You know, Alexandria Solzhenitsyn, a Soviet and Russian novelist who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1970 and wrote this. This is one of my favorite uh, quotes. I uh, remember this all the time. He said, Do not pursue what is illusionary property and position. All that is gained at the expense of your nerves, decade after decade, and is confiscated in one fell night. Live with a steady superiority of a life. Don't be afraid of misfortune. Do not yearn for happiness. 
it is after all all the same. The bitter doesn't last forever, and the sweet never fill the cup to overflowing. Good. It's a good sentence. It's enough if you don't freeze in the cold, if thirst and hunger don't claw at your insides. If your back isn't broken, if both arms can bend, if both eyes can see, if both ears hear, then whom should you envy? Whom should you envy? After all, you simply do not know it may be your last time to appreciate the one who provides everything for you on earth. Good stuff. Good stuff. We have to learn it now. Who is our ultimate provider? Or are we going to get disillusioned in thinking that we are the one who can give and receive? We spend our time, we give all our experiences, then we burn out. Then we burn out. Because we think that we are the one who can do the job, or we are the one who cannot do the job. You know, I'm going to show you a picture that I took when doing a singles ministry before. And his name is Wick Ware. Now you can put the picture on it. And the reason that I'm showing this picture, I was talking to him last week. I got permission from him and to show this picture to my church member. I took this picture in 2010, not because I loved him. Actually, I hated him at the time. It was 2010, one Sunday, he walked into my ministry and sat, sat right in front of me while I was teaching. And he looked very skeptical and uncertain of what I was teaching. I noticed that he was jotting down everything that I said. And he was crossing his arms and, you know, shaking his head and <laughs> had a smirking, smirking smile. And, I was not comfortable seeing that at all. Then after the meeting, he came up to me and asked me all the questions he had and pointing all the mistakes that I made, including my pronunciation. Jay, what you say doesn't go with this Bible verse. Jay, you kept saying lice. It's rice. It's not lice. <laughs> no one eats lice in this country. So he did critical remarks for the next six months. Next six months, he never missed any meeting. He always said, right in front of me, so I can look at you sitting in front of me. That's why. Whenever I saw him walking into my ministry, my heart kind of stopped. Stop. So I even prayed, God, please burn his car so he cannot come to church. And he started even calling me every night, 9, 4, 9 o'clock 42 p.m. 9 o'clock 42 p.m. He's a lawyer. He went to a Campbell exercise and ate dinner and he was 9.42. So he always called me, 9.42 p.m. I had a headache. It was stressful. No working. I was really, really stressful. Then Sujan told me, Jay, there, is, there must be a reason that he he's calling you he's is bugging you so why don't you just accept him spend some time for him instead of praying to burn his car <laughs> so i accepted i accepted him i spent some time for him i was even waiting for him to to call me at 9 42 p.m every night i set up set aside my time on every sunday so i did it for six months it was tough. It was tough. But I did it. The one day I went to UCLA hospital for an interview for my chaplain internship. And it was a part of my ordination process. And I already finished everything else. My exam, you know, church internship, and finished on my seminary school. So chaplaincy was my last one to be ordained. And it was dragging me down because 
The interview was my fourth attempt. In the last three years, I applied, but I didn't get it. You know, usually h o s p i t a l is best known for its chaplaincy. It was very competitive, very competitive to get in. So I didn't get it. So I was very nervous and worried because if I didn't get it in 2010, I might have to go to another state. So I went to interview, and the interview started. Then the director of internship told me, without asking any question, that I got a recommendation from the top leadership of the hospital. And I didn't know anyone in this hospital, especially executive officer. Then he showed me the recommendation from CEO, whose brother-in-law was Rick Ware. And I'm going to read the part of his letter. Actually, he, he sent, I got this recommendation in 2010, the first time to read. Actually, last night, it made me, made me kind of uh, emotional, actually. The letter said, i s part of it, My brother-in-law, Rick says, Jay is the most patient, generous, and spiritual person whom he has ever met. Jay is his pastor, and his advice makes Rick's life more fruitful and spiritual. Rick even calls Jay late every night, and he and his wife are always pleasant to Rick. (laughs) I'm sorry, I I was not pleasant, I'm sorry. (laughs) I truly believe that our hospital would get many benefits from Jay and his thoughtful. and loving heart. So I got the job. They got the recommendation two weeks before the interview. If I knew about it, I wouldn't have worry or have to sleep last night. The job was already guaranteed two weeks ago. Maybe six months ago when we walked into my ministry, the job was guaranteed, the job was promised. Our heavenly CEO, our Father, who controls and manages the universe, has recommendation for us. We don't need to have a sleepless night. We need to relax and trust. Trust. Do whatever He asks you to do and give something that belongs to Him. Don't take anything from Him that belongs to the Lord. It could be your tithe, time, talent, taking a photo or growing potato and sharing with other people, whatever it is. Just give it to Him. Don't hold it to yourself. God knows. That's the principle. God knows what we need. God knows what He's doing for us. He's in control. He's in control. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sometimes we forget one thing, one important principle in our lives. Everything is from you. So you give us everything and you can also take it back from us anytime. We look at the numbers sometimes in our bank account and are are excited and happy or frustrated and worried. What, What a fool we are. What a phobia. Hold us not, help us not hold everything in our hands that belongs to you. We know when we give, you will bless us more abundantly than we would ever imagine. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.